If you got a Bible, go, go to Genesis 26. Genesis 26. I'm, I'm truly, again, I'm honored to be here. My heroes are here, uh, man, and, and I, I'm just so glad. We're, we're so blessed to be able to be at a gathering that has this kind of emphasis, this kind of focus, and the anointing and the mantle that's on this ministry, Global Awakening. Thank God. Genesis 26, and we're going to start reading at verse 12. It says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. You think we could squeeze the word prosper in that verse anymore? The thing about the Lord blessing you and prospering you is not everyone is going to celebrate that. There's an urban term, young people would say haters going to hate. So in other words, when God blesses you, some people are going to get jealous. And it could incur attack as well. So watch this. It's actually going to happen. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great numbers of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Aha, there it is. Now the Philistines had stopped up, say stopped up, all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again, say dug again, the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. And we're going to stop. Many times in the, our vocabulary, the English vocabulary, we confuse words. Sometimes the confusion is understandable. For instance, the word cereal and cereal. I can understand why that would be mistaken. One is the profile of a psychopath, right? The other is the contents of Captain Crunch, okay? But you, you got to understand the context, right? Sometimes there's other words that maybe a letter can differentiate them, illicit, illicit. One is, speaks of something forbidden. The other means to draw or to invite something. But every now and then we confuse terms that's confusing that we confuse them. And these are two words, normal, typical. How many of you know you go to a doctor, he or she, you're, you're, you're coughing up the Mucinex men, you're slightly feverish, you're shaking a little dizzy, and he or she, the doctor, they check you out, they run you through the battery of tests, and they say to you, what you have is normal. How many of you know they've confused the term normal and typical? Because what you have is not normal compared to a healthy person. What you have is typical with a person that has your condition. So often, when we think of North American Christianity, and it's going to sound like I'm negative, but I'll be positive in two minutes, promise you. So often we compare ourselves by ourselves and what we think is normal Christianity isn't normal. It's typical of North American Christianity, but when you compare it to the book of Acts, it's not normal. It's subnormal. It's abnormal. And the reason why we need revival is that in revivals, God gives you a new normal. In revivals, God shows you what normal ought to look like. And until that happens, you don't know because you're looking at what you're looking at and kind of like, hey, we've got great presentation, we got great lights, we've got great media, we've got this going on. But then when you read the book of Acts or you understand church history, it could break your heart to know that we've settled for something less than what God would want to give us. I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I was in college. I grew up, as I mentioned, inner city uh, Oakland. Long story, I'm not going to bust out my testimony, but suffice it to say, it is a three-part Maury Povich episode, okay? So can't bust it all out now. I was raised by a grandma that was an alcoholic. My dad was not in the picture. Then he was in the picture. Then at nine years of age, my dad was murdered by policemen. Thank God for godly policemen. I've got relatives and friends, but these policemen, particularly the policemen that uh, uh, shot my dad, had a background in a racist hate group, profiled my dad. My dad committed no crime, didn't look like anyone had committed a crime, but one day they gunned him down, and so I lived in the aftermath of that. Grew up in high school experimenting, trying to grasp a hold of something that could answer the empty place in my heart. 
There was awards money given for the unlawful death of my dad who was shot in San Jose, California. Uh, the San Jose Police Department had to give monies. The monies enabled me to get higher education and go to college. Otherwise, we couldn't have been able to afford it. So I chose this small private college in Northern California, University of Pacific, and majored in computer engineering. When I was at this school, it was all of a sudden, there comes this point, I think, where you can run as far as you can without Jesus, and then the emptiness catches up. And I believe it's happening in our nation and in the nations of the world. There's a generation that is discovering that all the rest of this stuff has simply been cotton candy, and what we need is something of substance. I came back from a club one night. You guys recognize that would be a dance club, not the health club. Okay, I should say that. Just, just clarify, okay? And this emptiness became haunting. It took this sudden twist. They say of millennials, they say that probably upwards to 90% of them have had suicidal thoughts. And that's probably unfair. I think any generation you look at has probably had the thought of suicide. Maybe 9 out of 10. That would be true of any generation. I didn't just have the thoughts, family. I had a plan. I had a strategy. But my grandmother was an alcoholic. She got saved. She got delivered my last year in high school. I saw the transformation in her life. She would mail me uh, letters that had scriptures on it. She'd send me a Bible. And my grandmother was from the South, okay? I'm, I'm, some of you got that, some of you didn't. It meant my, my, my grandmother had a profession, okay? She was a professional disciplinarian, okay? If you understand, grandma's from the South. You know, kids, today get time out. My grandma would take a time out to rest her arm before she continued <laughs> beating me again. That was my grandma's time out, okay? So I say that to say when my grandmother would visit me in college, I'd make sure to pull my Bible out and put it over by my dorm. Just, grandma would hit me, okay? She would still hit me. So I came back from this party. My grandmother, probably after two years of me in college, she, she died, and that really rocked me. Like I can't even begin to explain to you. My grandmother passed. I remember one of the things she said to me before she died. She says, grandbaby, one day you're going to find out you cannot do this thing called life all on your own. Promise me you will call on the name of Jesus. And, of course, I'd say yes because she might hit me if I didn't say yes. <laughs> it was God. It was providence. It was prevenient grace. I'm sitting there after a club, and I'm, I'm bottomed out. I'm emptied out. And I, I, I do this desperate uh, cry. I, I literally didn't know that God would answer it. Did I believe that there was a God out there? Absolutely, as opposed to, you know, believing that we were an accident from the primordial soup. I was taking physics. I understood the second law of thermodynamics, and I go, the law of entropy, nah, no way. There had to have been a creator. I just didn't think he cared a lot about me, and somehow my family or I must have got on his bad side. Erroneous thinking, of course. But I just allowed this desperate cry. I, I said in this dorm room, I said, God, if you're real, I want to experience you. And if you let me experience you, I'll give you everything. I meant it. I passed out. Now, this group will get it. I do not have to give you the downsized version. I can tell you. I'm awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning. How many of you believe that God's got something about 3 o'clock in the morning? It's like God's favorite time to wake you up. It's the fourth watch of the night. I'm awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, this is the part that I know you'll get this. I see Jesus like I see you. I'm not kidding. I, I would not be here. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here if Jesus hadn't have showed up because my plan was to execute my suicidal exit plan. I see Jesus like I see you. People have asked me, what did Jesus look like? To me, he looked like God took the sun out of the sky and put it right. And when John says his face is like lightning, his, his, his face, his, his eyes are like lightning, face like the sun shining, he literally looked like embodying my light. He spoke. I heard the audible voice of God. And here was one of the things he said to me, right? He said, I'll be a father to the fatherless. You don't think the Lord is in touch with the needs of people and where you're at? I didn't even know until a month later that was in the Bible, but the word was speaking it to me, so it was the word in that moment. And I just want to stop and say this. What I had in that moment was an encounter. It was in my DNA. From that point on, and you'll, you'll understand what I mean when I say this, I couldn't be satisfied with a tidy little humanistic approach to a Bible study. When you have Jesus, 
a, a Christophany, an encounter show up in your room, it kind of all of a sudden raises your taste and your predilection and your hunger for something that's pure Jesus, that's God, that's otherworldly. And I prophesy to you, I, I've, the Lord spoke to me and said, Sean, I'm opening the encounter realm over this nation. You see, the secret weapon of all revivals, you think someone is hard. You think that, man, they would never give their life to Christ. They've got a Teflon heart. That's all true up until Jesus showing up in their room and telling them the deepest hurt and wound of your heart is exactly why I'm here. When God opens the encounter realm, all bets are off. You can have a dude killing Christians that ends up writing close to over a third of the New Testament, Saul to Apostle Paul. And when God opens up the encounter realm, immediately things that could have taken us 50 years to come into can happen in five seconds of encounters. And I'm telling you, there are people in Hollywood, there are entertainers, there are major degreed scientists and folks that are having encounter. And what we thought that may just happen in a village in a remote continent. God is opening up that level of encounter and dreams and visions and Joel 2 is going to become the reality, I believe, in our nation. I'm convinced of it and I believe you believe it too. So that encounter set that for me. And, and one of the things I just want to say is that begin to ask God for encounters. When we've gone too long without encounter, our Christianity ought to be based on relationship. When we've gone too long without encounter, religion in a, not a positive sense, religion, kind of ritualistic, kind of caught in a rut, doing our things becomes the norm because we've gone too long without encounter. Jesus wants to encounter us today, this morning. He does. So fast forward that because I'm saying that to set this up right here where we're going to talk about. Years later, I had this dream. Not every dream you get is of God, right? Some dreams are two hot dogs for 99 cents at the local mini mart. Shouldn't have ate them that late. But Job says God may speak in one way or another, yet a man does not perceive it. While men lay upon their bed, God seals instructions in their hearts. I got saved. I immediately went to a... a, a one of the older Pentecostal denominations, that was the campus ministry I was a part of. I'm in my 20s now, so I start going to this church. And my, ex my exposure to the prophetic is there was a precious Swedish lady. She was from Sweden. She had a beautiful accent and very prophetic intercessor. And maybe once every couple of weeks she would stand up in our church and say, Yay, the Lord would say unto you. And she'd prophesy. And she was on point. I mean, I would feel God. But it, it kind of almost caused me to believe that maybe only God wanted to speak to us once every two weeks. Because really, at that particular time, I, I wasn't exposed to a lot of the prophetic or God speaking. I knew God spoke, but like what, what we would call higher level revelatory release. Then I read this book by uh, an author. The book, I'll tell you the author's name in a moment. The book was called Hippo in the Garden, which is a strange title for, oh, come on. We got some folks that know that book. And I read this book, and this amazing man begins to describe how God speaks to you in dreams. And I'll be honest, I, I was getting dreams. I just didn't give it a lot of credibility or credence. And so I want to fast forward this part because I know you get that. So I became convinced God speaks through dreams. So here's what God does. I go to sleep one night. I get this dream. In this dream, the author of Hip on a Garden was an amazing prophet, pastor, apostolic leader by the name of James Ryle. He pastored at that time a vineyard church in Boulder, Colorado. He'd written this book. James Rowe is in the driver's seat in the car. Cars and dreams represent for me ministry or life. So he's in this, my life, or ministry. He's in the driver's seat. I'm in the passenger seat. We're going someplace. I don't distinctly remember where we were going. Pastor James turns to me. Again, I've never met this man. I only read his book. And the way I recognize him is on the back of the book. They usually have a picture of the author. So I'm like, oh, I know you. You're the one that wrote the book, you know. So he turns to me and he prophesies. He says, Sean, you are going to see a national outpouring of the Spirit. He says, you're going to see a generation raised up that's going to be armed and dangerous against the enemy that will dismantle powers and principalities over cities. Then he prophesies this third thing. You ever have a dream where you wake up and you didn't know you were dreaming till you woke up? I actually thought it was real. And I woke up and I immediately pull out my John Paul Jackson dream journal, right? 
<laughs> I started writing down, I'm going to see a national outpouring of the Spirit. Like, wow. I'm going to see a generation raised up. I mean, I could quote because this is, the dream was so vivid. Is that the word? And so I write down, I'm going to see a generation raised up that's going to be armed and dangerous against the enemy that's going to dismantle positive. And I'm going, wow, that's awesome to see a generation. And then I go to write the third entry, and I cannot remember it for my life. You ever do that? You get up and you only got part the dream? So I said, Lord, what was that? I prayed. I fasted. We have intercessors. Uh, and, and this time I'm, 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 I'm in ministry. I'm, I'm calling uh, our intercessors and say, please pray. And, and, and I want you to really pray because, you know, some people can lightly pray like they bless their roast beef sandwich at Arby's. I'm not talking about that. I want you to lose your weave for Jesus, okay? I want you to roll around in dung and roll back. And, and I'm, I'm talking heavy-duty intercession. This is what I need, right? They're praying. I, they're not getting nothing. I'm not getting anything. I go to do an outreach at the University of Colorado at Boulder. As I'm there doing an outreach, I'm in the hotel, and it dawns on me. Wait, the guy who wrote the book, who spoke to him in a dream, he pastors here. So I immediately begin to look up, and I found the, the number to the church, and I call the church. And, and some of you, most of you will get this, is that I, I have a theory that if you're a major ministry or church leader's administrator, you have to be part pit bull. You can't let everybody get to the man or woman of God, so you got to shield off some, uh, you know, flaky folks, okay? And you got to have discernment. So I'm calling, and I'm just excited. And I said, hello, can I speak to Pastor James Rao? I mean, I was a bit naive, just thinking, okay, hold on, let me get him on the phone. She says, who is this, and are you expecting a call? I said, no, 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 uh, he doesn't know me. I don't know him, but see, you know, I had this dream, and in his dream, he was in my dream, and he was talking to me, and, and there was a part of the dream I don't remember. I was kind of hoping maybe he could help me out. <laughs> True story. And then I say the thing you should never say if people think you're crazy. I know I sound crazy right now, but really, like, <laughs> confirmation. <laughs> The pit bull kicks in. She's beginning, I can feel, she's beginning to cut me off. Well, you know, he's busy right now, and he's got some appointments, and she's doing her job. She's doing an awesome job, and she's doing all this stuff. And I just say, please, please. I said, let me just leave a number, and if somehow, some way, he gets some free time in, in the day, this is my cell number, just have him call me or whatever. And, and so I didn't think anything would happen of it. Ten minutes later, I get a call, right? But I don't know who it is, right, because it's, it's just a number. And so they call, and they said, hello, is this Sean? And I go, yeah, this is Sean. I said, who is this? He said, James. I thought it was one of my friends playing a joke on me. I said, James who? He said, James Rao. I said, Ray, quit playing. Man, get off the phone. This is not James. <laughs> you know. He says, no, this is James Rao. I went, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm silent for a moment. And I said, uh, hey, Pastor James, I read your book. It's really impacted my life. Hey, hey uh, I, I had this dream. And he said, hey, man. What are you doing? About, it was probably about 11 o'clock. He said, what are you doing at noon? And I said, nothing. He said, come over to our office, man. I'd love to have you over and, and we'll have a, grab a bite. I'm like, oh, my God, what a great guy, right? So I show up in his office. Okay, now I'm going to super fast forward this. I didn't tell the secretary what the dream was. I just told her I had a dream. I didn't tell Pastor James Ryle my dream. I just said I had a dream. And so now I'm going to explain my dream to him. I said, well, hey, Pastor James, I had this dream, and in his dream, and he stops me. He says to me, he says, son, he says, God showed me you're going to see a national outpouring of the Spirit. You're going to see a generation raised up that is armed and dangerous, that's going to dismantle powers and principalities over cities. And then, he says, number three, he says, you're going to see a new Jesus people movement in his glory. Oh! 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 Woo! Mm. Woo, you guys be seated. Y'all got to, excuse me, I just went primeval. I just felt that thing again. James and I became friends. We, we golfed together, even though I don't, it's not for me, it's finding the white ball. That's the game for me. He was golfing. 
And I remember probably about a decade ago, we were doing a national men's conference together. And I was sharing this story, and he was smiling. And then all of a sudden, it hit me. And the Lord says that that word was like a time-release capsule. And the Spirit of the Lord says, now is the time for that word to come to pass. To the ancients, water as it is today, water is life. That one of the things you would find out for the ancients is the moment, let's say God's people, the moment God gave them a land, one of the first things they would do is build an altar to thank the Lord for the land. And one of the next things they had to do was dig a well. Why? Because water is life. You don't have water, you cannot sustain life. Your wife, your junior, your daughter, all of them, they dehydrate. Your cattle cannot survive. They were an agrarian culture. You cannot water your plants. Water was everything. To have a plot of land and to put a well on it, it was very similar to us having a title deed. To have a well on a land meant you own the land. You guys are following me. That the well spoke of ownership. So when the Philistines stopped up the well, it wasn't simply an act of vandalism. It was an act of blatant takeover. It's saying you don't own the land. We are going to revoke your right to this land. We're taking your inheritance. It wasn't simply, again, an evil, heinous act. It was a statement that we are taking the land and you have got to go. Now, Abraham, or yeah, Abram, Abram, he digs a well. The well is passed to Isaac, but here is the process. He says, remember the story, right? Abraham dug a well. Philistines came in and stopped up the well. Isaac redug the well. Notice when the Philistines stopped up the well. They waited till Abraham died. Are you with me? They didn't do that when he was alive. The enemy always tries to stop your flow in times of transition. I believe we can look at it in terms of historical narrative. I believe there are places in history where the enemy tried to stop a well in transition. In transitions, personally, we go through transitions in life. That We go through kind of chronological stages, and maybe after we come out of college, all of a sudden there's a transition, and we kind of are young marrieds, or you get your job, and the enemy always tries to stop your flow. And for that matter, I believe America, this is a T right here, I believe America is in the big T. We are in transition right now. I believe uh, UK is in transition right now. I believe the nations of the world are in transition, and it's in those times that the enemy seeks to stop wells, block wells, stop flows. Now, in this stoppage, and it's interesting because I feel like there are major giants, and just recently, obviously, Billy Graham, we were actually speaking in Charlotte, North Carolina, we literally, I got up that morning to get on the plane, and that's when I got the news, Billy Graham. If you could have posters of, man, spiritual giants, Billy Graham's poster would be in my room. As a, as a prophetic evangelist, my God, awesome. And I wept, and, and as I was weeping, I felt like the Lord says, but the mantle of mass evangelism did not leave the earth. In fact, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground, it dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In fact, there's a multiplication of mass evangelism. I think about the T.O. Osborns. I think about the Oral Roberts. And my cry is, is that many times in transition, when spiritual giants pass, the enemy tries to block the well, the fountains, the flow, the truths of what they represent. And we have to be particularly careful and conscientious that in times of transition that we're not allowing ancient wells to be blocked up because this is exactly what the enemy does. He waits for a, a movement, a ministry, a truth, a revelation to flourish. And in times of transition, he tries to block up the well. Now imagine you got a well, okay? I'm going to borrow this. I'm going to borrow this one, okay? You imagine you have a well. This is going to be my well right now, right? You imagine you have a well, and the well has been blocked up, right? You're Isaac. You're the next generation. Come on. So you have it. Isaac, what if Isaac would have just left the well blocked up? Because he had to dig and he had to make a choice. This is my father's well. It is an inheritance. I'm going to redig that well. And in fact, he dug new wells. That's just a hint, hint. You don't just inherit wells. It's a, obli it's a holy obligation to dig new wells as well. So 
He's there. He has his choice. And I thought, if he doesn't redig the well, this is a blocked well, right? It's a blocked well. Maybe at best, maybe it's a trickle, little diminished flow coming out. What if that becomes the norm? If he doesn't redig the well, what if block well diminished flow becomes the norm? Now, let me, let me expl- uh, elaborate on this. I feel like there's a generation that has grown up next to block well diminished flow Christianity. And so they feel that's all there is because they've never seen the well flourish. I know you have. You're an exceptional breed. But I talk to believers that they've never been in a service where the Holy Spirit's loving conviction comes so strong that the appeal to the altar call is never given. Person jumps up in the middle of the message, runs down and leaves all their drug paraphernalia on the altar because the presence of the Lord was so strong. Never been in a meeting where the anointing of the word was so strong, someone would stand up, shriek, fall to the ground, shake, get delivered without anyone doing deliverance because Jesus, the deliverer, is on the scene. I've been in meetings like that. You've been in meetings like that. I was in a meeting where my mentor, I was at the meeting. It was in Oakland, California. A a precious dear sister uh, uh, from Asia, she was in a wheelchair. And he stops the meeting. He says, ma'am, the power of God is on you. You know, that's kind of how he talked. He said, get up off that wheelchair. She doesn't move. He says, ma'am, the power of God is on your body. Get up right now. She doesn't move. And you could feel the atmosphere of the room. It's like all of a sudden all the oxygen's getting sucked out of the room. They're thinking, this is the overexposure of a human vessel. Uh Uh-oh. He said, usher, please help me. Place your hand on this woman. Usher comes behind the woman, puts his hand. She's startled, jumps up. Her little shawl, whatever, falls off her lap. She's looking totally shocked. The woman takes a couple steps, and then all of a sudden she starts walking. She starts running back and forth. We found out she had been in that wheelchair for 18 years. Some of you know, that's not just a gift of healing. That's working the miracles going on. Everyone starts standing up and clapping except me and another college student. We hit the floor bawling. I read about this, and now I'm seeing this. It changes you. It changes what your norm, what you believe for, what you think is on the table for you. But if all you've had is a generation has grown up against block well, diminished flow, we're going to bind and gag the Holy Ghost, put them in a back room, pull them out on Wednesday small groups, because we don't know the Holy Spirit may upset the first time visitor coming in. We got a block well, diminished flow Christianity. And we think that's normal. It's not normal. It's not. It's not normal. Okay, so now, (laughs) you guys get me too excited. I'm a very excitable person, so I'm doing it. I just got to take a deep breath right now. Calm down. Okay. I've come all the way from California to tell you, as much as this group flows, there's still more that the well can produce. As much as you've seen, there's so much more to the well. I think about a generation, and, I, and my heart goes out. The evangelist in me, my heart breaks when I think of people, visitors that walk out of our churches, and they kind of reject Christianity, but they didn't reject Jesus. They didn't reject Book of Acts vintage. They reject blocked well diminished flow Christianity and truth be told you may have been right to walk out on that because that's Jesus didn't get up out of tomb on the third day for a little trickle to come out in a in a Sunday morning service he wants there to be a flow somebody say flow 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 woo 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 Oh, amen. Randy, I found my tribe. I'm home. I'm home. I think that there has to be a generation of well breakers. Isaacs that not only for the sake of the Lord, but for the sake of the next generation. 
we dig wells and to make sure they get to see the flow the way it's meant to happen. They get to see a pedal to the metal, full throttle Christianity. Not a knockoff discount version of the holy reality, but the real deal. Jesus shows up. One of the ways that I witnessed and would lead people to Christ, and about a month after I got saved, I led about 25 people to Christ. Not that I was that great at witnessing. It was that they were that shocked that I was saved. Okay, so I'm just going to tell it like it is. But I had such a faith that Jesus would encounter them. Even if I ran against the highest skeptics that could run circles around me intellectually, I said, bro, or, or sis, hey, hold on for a second. If you're a serious seeker of truth, let me pray for you right now that you would encounter God. And within 24 hours, I want to have a meeting with you because I know Jesus is going to show up in your room like he showed up in mine. I led people to the Lord because they would go get an encounter, not because I was that persuasive in my argument. It was that they would get an encounter, and I believe this is how it's supposed to be. Because I came up by a well that flowed. And then I began to think, if you, and you guys are still with me, and, and I mean this in total humility. I believe that part of our well-being open up is it's not just motivational messages replacing the presence. That if I could say it, <laughs> I want to be as great a communicator as I can for God's glory. But let me tell you what, this doesn't need any more TED Talks. We need some Jesus walks. That's what we need. We need Jesus walks. I would love to be as polished in my communication, but I'd rather be raw, stumble over words and have Jesus show up Catherine Coleman style any day. Any day. Any day. No brainer. Give me that. Give me 13 people getting up out of wheelchairs. Give me, you know, with the Morticia Adams clothes, just doing like this, an entire security force falling in the Shrine Auditorium being packed literally week after week after week and pointing up in deaf ear, ears opening up. I'll take that any day. Give me a well that flows, a well that's open. Mm. Our wells have to be open. How many of you would agree with that? When your wells aren't open, eloquence replaces the demonstration of power. Motivational talks replaces the message of the cross. Entertainments, entertainment replaces presence. And human ability, in, its, in, in a fact, eclipses divine release. We got to have open wells. It says that the Philistines blocked the wells. I looked that word up. And there's actually two categories of, of words. So this is our well. When it says the Philistines stopped up the well, somebody say stopped up. stopped up. It means to block, and it means to keep closed. So the Philistines, they would get debris, they would get rocks, they would get dirt, they would get the earth, and they would come and they would uh, close it off. They would close it off and, or block it off, keep it closed. So follow me. The devil's working on the front end that after a major move of God, a revival, the enemy is immediately trying to close down the fountain that released that outpouring. He goes on the front end. But watch this. Once he stopped it, according to that word, he tries to keep it closed. There are demonic powers, watch me, that enforce the closing of revelation, of miracles, of flow, of revival, of what God has done. You live in a state, this is Pennsylvania. Do you know right after the Welsh revival with Evan Roberts, there was a large number of, of Welsh people that populated your state? They were like, our people, my mama, my daddy, my cousin, my uncle, you know, their experience of power of God. And because they tapped into that well, though they were separated by this big old pond called the Atlantic, a revival broke out in Pennsylvania. It's in history. In late 1904, after early 1904, Evan Roberts has his encounter that spills over, and the little girl, Flory Adam Evans, says her statement. And as a result of that, a well opens up over here. So revival hit here, and then it went cross over to Azusa Street. You were the pre-Azusa Street well before God used W.J. Seymour. And Frank Bartleman, that you were the pre-Azusa well. You were the pre-Azusa move. When the enemy not only tries, so what the enemy do, he tries to block the flow. He tries to block a well, but then he tries to keep it closed. Now here's the second shade of meaning. You're right. Those are the first sh shades, so they're very similar. The word the Philistines stopped up the well also means this. 
It means to disguise. It means to camouflage. So the enemy not only fills the well up and tries to keep it blocked, he tries to hide it so you don't even know it's there. That they would try to put so much dirt around it that you'd be like the Israelite and you're just kind of walking by and you don't even realize that mound right there is a well that could release life that could sustain you. Why? The enemy tries to hide us from wells because we won't dig if we don't know the wells are there. If you don't recognize that there's been prophetic promise and intercession and, and the saints have cried out and God's promise over a land, if you don't know it's there, you won't fight to get it open. So the enemy goes back to the camouflage thing. Maybe even on a personal level, maybe your well could be your quiet time. The enemy not only tries to close you off, he tries to disguise it. We get so distracted, we don't even realize, and we're so busy doing this stuff that we're not just getting time for him to pour into us. You remember Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink out of their innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. If there's a problem with your flow, the problem isn't with your flow. The problem is with your drink because Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty, let them come to me and drink out of their innermost being shall flow. If you want to address your flow, you got to address your drink. If your flow is off, it's because you're drink. You're not drinking enough. That's one thought. Here's the second thought. Jesus expects your drink to become a flow. He expects it. It's good you're drinking, so you are a group that's drinking. Well, God expects there to be a flow of his compassion, a flow of his word, a flow of signs and wonders, that when we leave the double door, stained glass windows, that there's something that can impact the marketplace, your office cubicle, your university, whatever it is, your drink ought to become a flow. Come on, touch somebody say your drink ought to become a flow. Okay, how many of you give me about 12 more minutes? How many of you just give me? Okay, 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 okay. All right, awesome, awesome. You may have a block well if. We're going to play this again. You may have a block well if. You may have a block well if you walk in more frustration than you do joy. I call it spiritually crispy. You ever get around spiritually crispy Christians. Now, we're supposed to be spiritually crisp, but some of us have become spiritually crispy, right? I want my vegetables crisp. I don't want my vegetables crispy, okay? And what happens is I believe part of the frustration really is meant to be a fuel because the frustration is actually this point of what you've attained and what you're reaching for, and the gap in between is the frustration gap. Frustration ought to be your friend. In fact, I feel like the only hope for the nations of the world are frustrated Christians that are not okay with status quo and the way things are, but something breaks them and says, God, I believe that there's something more, and I'm not going to settle for the less when the more is available. A hunger for the more. I'm not going to do the normal little Christian thing and this and that, or North American or UK Christian thing. There's something in me that's fiery, that's ignited, and I see that in this group. You have a block well if you're spiritually crispy. The second one I'll bring out is this, is that when you're spiritually bored, you have a block well if you're constantly investing your passions in something outside. There's a lot of things I like to do, no doubt. I do mixed martial arts. I know I probably don't strike you as a guy that does that. I'm not going to get an octagon on UFC 220 or anything like that. But I, I love to do, and I love to train. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. But my passion if I will call my passion of my life is not in that. That's, a, that's an interest. My passion is in the king and the kingdom being expanded. And throughout my life, I think there's always this place where we've got to check and see, have we become spiritually bored and our passions are being invested in something outside? At the end of the day, end of the day, man, all this stuff fades away. We got but a moment. Our life is but a vapor. And then we stand before the Almighty. And I, I'm thinking, man, I want our lives to be invested in something that will ring for eternity way beyond. That's thinking like a well. Abraham dug a well because he's thinking about Isaac. That well was going to be passed down from Isaac to Jacob. And if I can get a worship team to get ready, I'm already kind of beginning to signal my last little turn here. Why would the enemy fill up a well? 
Well, they wanted to, of course, take your land, say you don't belong there. But think of what happens. When a well is filled up and you, let's say you're at a point where you still know the well is there, you go there and it's all filled up and then your other well's filled up, you become dehydrated. Spiritual dehydration is on the opposite end of the spectrum of revival. For some people, even Christians, the wells of your salvation are beginning to dry up. And we got to take a deeper drink. Do you know, and I'm an inner city Oakland kid telling you this one, right? You got to dig deep to get fresh water. You got to dig below the water table. The uh, deeper the water, the purer the flow. The deeper the water, right? The more expensive the water is. That's why we don't, sh shallow waters are dangerous. That's why we're not going to go outside in a parking lot and drink out of puddle, right? Your dog may drink out of that puddle. Your dog may leave something in that puddle. But you're not going to drink because we know that surface waters are dangerous. I believe it's something that can be translated or correlated over to the spirit. That surface shallow waters of Christianity can be dangerous if we stay in that too long. I believe people are tired of the superficial. We want the real. We want authentic. We want to encounter God. And there's a hunger. I believe there's a whole new understanding, a reformation that's going to come to the church of understanding that, man, there are people out there hungry. We, we think they don't want the supernatural. How wrong are we? You got shows called The Supernatural, Lucifer, Legion. Come on. We're trying to take the Holy Ghost and, and kind of making sure he's more palatable if he's even in the room, but we'd rather go another route because we're afraid. They've grown up on supernatural cartoons, played supernatural video games. Every other trailer of every movie coming out is supernatural. And then we get this <laughs> doofus look in our eyes and think the supernatural might be overwhelming. No, that's what they're hungry for. That's what they want. They want every intellectual I've ever witnessed to. We still reach out to universities. They all want a reality they can't wrap their man, cerebral cortex around. They all hunger for something beyond. Whew. Isaac understood something. So let me give you this. First of all, five quick points of being a well breaker. Because I don't think it would be fair to talk to you about breaking open wells. You're a well breaker and not give you some pointers as to how to do it. So if you want to take notes, cool. If not, hey. What makes you a well breaker? How do you come? Number one, if you're taking notes, you can be a well breaker. You have to have a scent for water. Makes sense, right? You can't find the water, you can't dig the well. You have to have a scent for water. I believe more than anything, more and more, we need to have a scent for Holy Spirit. We have to understand that, hey, man, we have our program. We can do our thing, our daily routines and everything. But, man, my question is this. Can Jesus call an audible in your midst? I got this thing all mapped out. This is how it's going to go and everything. And, man, I'm telling you what. <laughs> we have so programmed stuff sometimes or in our daily lives. We've so, man, organized and scheduled out everything that Jesus can't show up and call an audible. Right? Come on, and this is the state of Pittsburgh Steelers. Come on. Big Ben has walked up to the line. He's read the defense. Big Ben Roethlisberger, however you say his name, right? He's read the defense and go, I know the coach said that, but based on the defensive packages, we need to change the play. And I believe that there are times that those little Holy Spirit interruption excursions can release more power per moment than anything we can imagine. The Lord can, man, in a moment direct you to someone on the street and you can see someone get saved, get delivered, get filled. But Jesus has to call the audibles. You have to have a scent like, hold on. Hold, wait, 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 wait. I smell the water. You got to be a, oh, come on now. <laughs> I know the single, single girls, you have to have a scent for water on that perspective. You start sniffing. No, you smell like Hennessy. I don't know if you smell like water, okay? Number two, I'm going to move a little quicker. Yeah, 
You have to have a scent for water. Number two, you can't be content with cisterns. You must dig wells. Cisterns. Grew up inner city. We were economically challenged, a.k.a. Po. Not poor, Po. P.O. Couldn't afford the other O and R on Wheel of Fortune. You don't have $250, say, Vanna, I'll buy a vowel. Because Vanna and Wheel of Fortune, they don't accept food stamps. So I'm sorry, Sean, you got to stay Po. Okay, I'm Po. We had an ice box. You know you had an ice box growing up if your parents had to thaw out the freezer part because there would be a ridge of ice that would build up. So you had to thaw it out. That's when you had an ice box. We had an ice box. We have a refrigerator that was a little more up the pay grade than where we were at growing up in our apartment. Many times before my mom got paid or my grandma would get her check uh, and things were tight, sometimes our refrigerator would be empty. But there would always be two things in our refrigerator. Number one, there would be a cut off <laughs> box of Arm & Hammer baking soda. I told you I grew up by a southern grandmother. She believed that, and I'm, I'm sure it's true, that the Arm & Hammer baking soda would absorb all the smells out of your refrigerator. I was a young kid. I go, Grandma, it worked too good. We don't have chicken or ham anymore in our refrigerator. The box just sucked it up. It's gone, you know. The other thing we would have, <laughs> you guys are so gracious. The other thing we would have is a pitcher of red Kool-Aid. Hey, Kool-Aid. Now, I'm, I'm dating myself, right? Because you get that little, you know, we got it cheap. And there was even a knockoff version of Kool-Aid. You put a cup of sugar in it, pour water in it, and you had something to drink, right? I knew that picture in our refrigerator. I know that that's a cistern. But last year, I was in an underground uh, dugout reservoir right by Temple Mount in Israel. And there was 30 millennial pastors, myself and another friend of mine that led it. And we were in underground. That is a cistern too. I didn't know of that as a cistern. So here's what we do. Sometimes because our cistern is bigger than the other person's cistern, we compare cistern to cistern. But no, 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 no. Jesus, through the prophet Jeremiah, says, my people have committed two evils. You've gathered for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that could hold no water. And you've, in a sense, left me the fountain of living water. In our context, the well. You could have this artesian well, but you've left it. And so it gets back to this thought right here. You can't be settled for things that limit. We want a free flow of the Holy Spirit. We want a deep drink. Number three, you have to have faith to strike water. You have to have faith to strike water. People say, Sean, you're disciplined. And, and I don't know. I, I, I'd like to think so. But I don't know. You know, like discipline, like, man, daily, man, I'm digging out rocks, man. Because all revivals first begin with a clear out. The wells are wells of revival. They had to get out the rocks. Uh, Isaac redug the wells. All revivals begin with a clear out. Asbury College, 1970, a chapel service began that began to go practically two weeks straight that influenced so many different people that it spread to Canada. It spread across the United States. At the time when young college students were burning flags, their hearts were burning for a move of God, all because in a chapel service, a guy that led it at this uh, small Christian college opened it up for some testimonies. And all of a sudden, historians would describe, I write about this in our book, like a lightning bolt leap from one person to the next, sharing their testimony. And I thought they were repenting of sins, and that's what started the Asbury revival. Will, Will Moore, Kentucky, they began clearing out rocks. Sometimes you get weary and just rock clearing just getting dirt out and just walking and dropping off this rock and then all of a sudden you're digging up this dirt, dropping off this dirt. And, and we call this discipline and it is. But I don't know that my motivation is just to get rocks out. I'm not focusing on the debris to be removed but the water to be received. If I'm disciplined, let me tell you what it is. It's because I'm water driven. The whole while, I'm not thinking about how much work this takes because I wouldn't do this if I didn't think at the end of the day I'd strike water. You're not going to get up at your church service for early morning prayer crying out for revival in your region. You're not going to cry out for the young people in your neighborhood that are losing their lives. If you don't believe at the end of the day, you'll strike water. You won't go overseas and be trained and equipped in signs and wonders if you don't believe you're going to strike water. You wouldn't have flown and paid for a hotel and what it cost you to be a part of this sold out conference. If you didn't believe at the end of the day, you'll strike water. All well breakers have this truth that they understand. We believe we are going to strike water. That's why we do what we do. We do it for His glory. But I believe 
that you and I will strike water that the nations of the world's wells are going to begin to open up once again that God is going to water the earth from the internal wells of revival okay all right five minutes how many give you five minutes all right all right okay man. yeah we do we, he told me I could go to noon but I, I just want to be sensitive this is a conference right so we can go a little bit right John chapter 4 John chapter 4 read this preached on this as an evangelist many times Jesus tells his disciples go get food I, I got to go through Samaria he walks up to a well now watch this and I write about this in our book prophetic evangelism Jesus was drawn to the well before the woman at the well got to the well sometimes in prophetic evangelism you're drawn to the where before the who gets there you always go to this Starbucks but you don't know why today you're gonna go to this Starbucks you need to sit there for a moment because all of a sudden you're going to find out the reason why you felt the need to come to this Starbucks. So that lets, lets me know that maybe there was a little more significance on the well than I initially anticipated. You know the story. The woman comes up to the well, Samaritan woman. Jesus says, can I have a drink? Obviously, the gender and race issue is immediately brought up. Jesus said, Anyone who drinks from this well will thirst again. I love this in Evangelist. He was pointing out the utter inability of this well to fulfill your thirst. Girl, what you thirst for, this well is not going to handle it. But if you take a drink from what I'm offering you, it will become a well in you. Deep. And she says, you have nothing to draw with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Conversation shifts. And, and ultimately he says, hey, Go call your husband. She doesn't want to drink. Go call your husband. She says, I've had no husband. Or, or, or excuse me. She's, he says, go call your husband. And Jesus said, I don't have a husband. He says, you're very accurate in that statement. You've had five husbands, a man you're living with now, you're not married to. Jesus didn't say that to shame her. I believe he was pointing out the desperation of this woman. Because you had to know she wanted to be married. She's hoping this sixth guy would marry her and dignify. Because here she is in the middle of a place where this was not cohabitation. That was not a place that would be looked on favorably for her or as a place of empowerment for her at all. She wanted him, a man to marry, but she's desperate. And Jesus began to direct us towards what she really was hungry for. The whole conversation went to worship. She walks into her neighboring village there in Sakar, Samaria. And she walks in this village, she tells people, she's an evangelist, when you drink like that, of that well, you gotta tell somebody because a drink becomes a flow. The entire group comes back and they come to Jesus and we find this from the narrative of the scripture. They said, we no longer believe, this is the town's folks, to the lady, we no longer believe because of what you said, we now believe because of ourselves. And I thought, wow, I preached on it many times. What an awesome passage. God, man, met the needs uh, 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 redemptively speaking of a needy Samaritan woman, but then things started to pop up. Sometimes you begin to read scripture and then a revelation begins to percolate. I'm going to fill it. And I thought, huh, he was drawn to the well first. And in fact, the Bible says it was Jacob's well. Okay, Genesis 12, God shows up to Abraham. That's where we began. Abraham, he's Abram. And he says, hey, I'm going to give you this land. It's called Shechem, Shechem, Shekar, Sakar, same. Okay, I may not be pronouncing that right, but you get it. He says to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land and your descendants, and I will bless you there. Abraham immediately builds an altar, and ultimately what? A, you're listening, a well. Abraham dies in times of transition. The enemy always tried to block wells. Isaac had to redig the wells and dug new wells, right? Isaac passed those wells down to his son, Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In John 4, it's called whose well? Jacob's well. Jacob has 12 sons. The second youngest, Joseph. Joseph's special, has a dream. Father has favor on him, makes him a nice coat. His 10 older brothers throw him in a pit, sell him in a slave. And by the way, my definition of a dysfunctional family is when your brothers sell you, throw you in a pit, take your jacket, and sell you into slavery, you come from a dysfunctional family. Okay, so he, he, you can relate. You know the story of Joseph. Ultimately, he interprets the dream, saves the economy, is, is, is in a place of governmental authority. His brothers, he reveals himself to his brothers. They go get his dad. Now here's the, the scene. We, we, we said all that to get to this. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is old now, sees his son Joseph. He feels fulfilled. And he says, hey son, you got to promise me this though. You cannot bury me here in Egypt. 
essentially, I'm not uh, the wording, you got to take me out there and bury me. And he's buried in Shechem by the well. Promise. Remember, three gener- four, at this point, four generations early, God shows up to Abraham, says, I'm going to bless you here. He broke a curse, the Canaanite curse, off a of land, and he put a well there, speaking of ownership. All of a sudden, it goes down generation, generation, generation. And in fact, Joseph himself is buried pretty close. He's buried in Shechem. Scholars uh, would acknowledge that. So this well has all this promise. It's buried. It's underneath the ground. It's a prophetic word. So here's what I submit to you. What if when Jesus walked up to the well in John 4, what if it wasn't just, and he would do it for the one. Somebody say the one. What if it wasn't just to bring salvation to a needy Samaritan woman? What if Jesus, the living well, was there to unlock a well to revive and to bring life to a revival narrative 1,500 years in the making. That when he did, in the spirit, something spilled over in the surrounding community that Abraham was initially promised, a prophetic word hovering. Hidden seed, revivalist Comenius and others talked about hidden seed in the ground that sprouted to the Reformation. Hidden seed, there's hidden seed in your area, in your region. And as this thing spills over, All of a sudden, these people are fulfillment of a promise given because the well breaker showed up at a well and broke open a well. What would happen if we broke open wells in our nations? I know there are many nations. I submit to you there's a new outpouring, a new overflow, a new move of the Spirit, a new harvest when we say yes. And here's the bottom line. We got to get back to digging. We got to get back to digging. I don't want to make it sound like it's a works thing. But the kids always talk about hashtag just grind or grinding it, grinding it out. And people will grind it out with their professions. They'll grind it out going after their sports teams and filling out the NCAA brackets when that was in or their fantasy football. And then they come to church and they don't do that anymore. Hashtag hard work, hashtag all that. And then we come and we'll put all our passions and efforts there. And we're saying, man, we're in the hour of the greatest harvest of all. And I'm saying, let's be well breakers. Bow your heads. Jesus. Lord, I thank you, God, that, Lord, that there is a room full of people that you died for, your blood was shed for, that you love. That, God, I believe that there are wells. They represent in the context that I feel like the Lord's breathing on for us the word of God, promise, prophetic words, former moves of God, original intention because God's original intention over an area remains regardless of how far left or right that region or those people go. God's original intention stays in place and the wells reminds us, remind us of original intention. Lord, I believe that this is a room full of well breakers. And God, it first begins by getting our flow back. Some of us, we've lost our flow. Something has stopped our flow, that we feel a numbness. We feel like maybe part of the reason why we're here is to get our flow back. That kind of, there's been a starting and stoppage. There's been kind of a slow leak, but there's something that we know that, God, I know I want to flow in the prophetic, in revelatory release, in signs and wonders, in prophetic evangelism, in harvest, in the things of the kingdom. I want to flow in divine compassion. As the Bible says, Jesus was moved with compassion and fed the multitude something's been blocking my flow and I'm here because God it's time before I become the well breaker God I need the breaker anointing to break me wide open because if I get my well they'll get their flow if I get my well they'll get their flow so Lord I just pray put your hand on your heart Father I just pray all across this place people that say Lord I felt blockage in my life I felt like there's been a starting and stopping. I felt like doubt as a thief has come and put another boulder in my well. I feel like, Lord, I've gotten away from really hungering and believing for my region. Lord, I've become familiar with where you placed me at my workplace, at my school, at my job, in my city. Lord, I've taken my region for granted. Lord, I've, I've, and, and looking back, 
It was the enemy slowly bringing another rock, slowly casting some more dirt. But Lord, I say, open up a well. Open up a well. Open up a well. Lord, we pray for that breaker anointing. We pray, go ahead, bro, just begin to sing over us. If you want to come to this altar, come. There's rooms on the sides, in the altar, wherever. But you just find a place. Lord is breaking something off you. There's a new flow. There's a deeper place. Deep, calls under deep. The sound of your waterfall.